In the jungles of Southeast Asia, a people has preserved a cultural heritage which follows the traditions of an archaic heroism. A few chosen warriors are responsible for guarding the community against all evil. It is believed that this requires a special force, fertility, which exists inside the head of all beings. Through decapitation, this force becomes available and passes on to the warrior, his clan and all its goods. Myanmar, formerly British Burma, a melting pot of dozens of peoples with approximately 50 million inhabitants. At least two-thirds are Burmese, the rest consists of ethnic minorities. The hallmark of Myanmar's capital is the Suedagon Pagoda, a symbol of the country's sovereignty, a reminder of its former wealth. More gold than is owned by the Bank of England was supposedly used in its construction. Buddhism is the main religion in Myanmar. Every day hundreds of Buddhist pilgrims flock to the pagoda to make offerings and to seek comfort from the Buddha. According to legend, the pagoda's beginnings reach back to the 5th century before Christ to the times of Gautama Buddha himself. It is said that sacred reliquaries are kept inside the golden stupa. Approximately 800 miles north of Yangon lies the capital of Sagaing district, Naga territory for centuries. Jungle hills along the border divide the Naga from their tribal relatives in neighboring India. Kamti is inhabited by members of various Naga groups. They prefer the district headquarters' busy life to the seclusion of the jungle hills. Members of other ethnic groups also live and work here. But within this colorful hodgepodge, Tattoo marks identify the Naga unmistakably. Chindwin, the Golden River, is the region's source of life. Many of the local fishermen try their luck by digging in the riverbed where much of Myanmar's gold is supposed to be hidden. But not many, it seems, are striking it rich. From January till May, the Chindwin's water level is low. When the monsoon sets in, the rains are heavy and the river floods its banks. The Chindwin is the main access to the northwestern parts of Myanmar. But the river has many sandbanks and it takes an experienced pilot to steer the boat. Nevertheless, the river is the fastest and most important link through the vast jungle. A few settlements still dot the river banks. But upstream, towards the north, they become fewer and fewer. Only a few outsiders have ever found their way into Naga territory. The last expedition took place in 1937. Since then, no researcher has been able to enter the headhunter's mysterious world. The Naga Hills are a rough terrain. In the inaccessible terrain, man and machine have to fight their way along every inch of the track. Approximately 60 miles north of Kamti lies the Naga village of Lahe. The houses of Lahe cling to the mountain slopes. 
almost 2,000 Naga inhabit the village. Only a small part of the village community follows the Buddhist faith. Most of the Naga still practice their ancient natural religion. The Naga believe in the animation of all beings. Through the soul and the spirits inhabiting themselves and all other creatures, they communicate with each other and feel unified as one big community. The most precious tool of all Naga is their iron machete, the Dao. The production of a Dao hasn't changed in a thousand years. Each machete furnished by the blacksmith is a unique piece of craftsmanship. A Dao is strong as a sword and as sharp as a razor blade. In the hands of a headhunter, it can become a feared and deadly weapon. A person who has the means to sacrifice a mython buffalo is held in high esteem and may show his prestige to all through tattoo marks. To apply the tattoo pattern, pine wood is cut into fine splints and burnt. The soot supplies the color for painting the initial patterns on the skin. The burnt wood is rolled into leaves of the pegi plant and pressed. The ritual production of the mixture follows ancient, well-established rules. Only an authority may lead the preparations. It is mostly the chief's wife who preserves this traditional knowledge. Herbal juices and soot blend into a bluish-black substance. Formerly, tattoos were allocated only after a warrior had successfully hunted a human head. With specially shaped bamboo sticks, the tattooist applies the patterns. Naga warriors display their tattoos with pride, since they are seen as symbols of manliness and strength. Patterns on the chest point to a man's fertility. Women are tattooed with the onset of menstruation. Among the Lenong Naga, girls who have reached puberty receive tattoo lines on the chin and a pattern on the forehead. This protects them against evil spirits and dangerous animals. Patterns on the upper arms, however, mark the married women. When the mixture of soot and herbal juices has been applied, the painful part of the ceremony commences. With a thorny needle, the patterns are stamped into the lower skin layers. The taut skin swells and often becomes inflamed but this makes the tattoo last for years, even for an entire lifetime. Prestige and honor are also extended to warriors through jewelry made from seashells. These have found their way to the remote Naga Hills from the distant Bay of Bengal, approximately 1,200 miles away. Each middleman successively raises the price of this valuable item, 
Thus, the seashells stand for wealth and high social rank. During the New Year festival, the Hashik Naga perform an ancient fertility ritual. To the beat of the drum, the women form a sacred circle well guarded by their men. With their eyes closed, the women fully concentrate on the force streaming through them. According to their belief, this force, the power of the earth, connects all the beings in the world. For many Naga, the great festivals are welcome occasions to leave their villages and to acquire goods they don't possess at home. The path leads deep into the jungle. In this vast, untouched nature, even the natives make slow progress. Beyond the footpaths, the tropical rainforest is impenetrable. Only the villagers know the right track through this green labyrinth. Strangers left to their own devices would be hopelessly lost. But even the Naga have to conserve their strength on such a strenuous march. <laughs> well guarded against surprise attacks by enemy headhunter tribes, all traditional Naga villages are built on the distant hilltops or along the mountain ridges. At Long Nock, the family are already waiting, full of anxiety and expectation to see their relatives. The small hilltop village is inhabited exclusively by the Lenong Naga. Hardly anyone here has ever seen a foreigner before. <laughs> Even the ancient army telephone seems like an alien instrument from another world. It is the only connection to the outside world, a bridge to modernity. At Long Nock, there is no electricity. After sunset, when the darkness falls, the villagers retire to their huts, a way of life resembling primeval times. The age-old Naga culture seems untouched by modern civilization. According to Naga belief, the Nart spirits lived peacefully with mankind until men started to trick the Nuts. The Nuts became enraged and henceforth disturbed man's life whenever they could. Some people, however, wanted to find out about the Nuts' will and for this matter relied on dreams and omens. Ever since, fortune tellers and shamans have provided the link between man and spirits. Shamans discern future and fate from the way a cock turns his claws in the moment of death. If the claws turn right, it is taken as a favorable omen. Stretched towards the left, they indicate bad luck.
Animal sacrifice, however, also serves the healing of diseases. The shaman's assistant smears the blood of the sacrifice cock on the patient's painful spot of the daily routine in the remote rice placed on a banana leaf and starts praying to the nuts. The prayer is supposed to appease the spirits and alleviate the patient's suffering. <laughs> Animal sacrifice and prophecy are part of the daily routine in the remote world of the mountain villages. Life is simple and follows the laws of nature. Nature provides all the necessities of traditional Naga life. Artistic craftwork from cane strips are the Naga men's domain. The women's tasks focus on running the home. As in all Southeast Asian countries, rice is also Myanmar's main staple food. Last year's harvest is stored in granaries raised on stilts. Stone plates on the top of the stilts guard the granaries against the intrusion of rats. The numerous granaries house the provisions of rice of the different clans. The clan with the highest surplus of provisions will share its wealth with the other villages at the end of the year. This will secure it eternal prestige. The granaries are located at the outskirts of the village. This is meant to prevent the provisions from being burned should a fire break out in the village. It used to be the custom among some Naga groups to place the skulls of deceased clan members on the fields or into the rice stocks. The fertility believed to be stored in the skulls was supposed to flow into the seeds and provide the clan with bumper crops. Dark and resonant beats echo from the jungles behind the hill, announcing a great event. The Nokor Naga are agreed. Their village requires a new log drum. To pull the enormous wooden log along the twisted jungle paths requires superhuman effort. Nevertheless, all the warriors put their backs into it because the drum, once pulled into their village, will make them even stronger. In front of the log drum, law is spoken. Disputes among clan members are settled. Controversial questions are decided and hunts are planned. The right tree for the log drum had been chosen in a dream. It took weeks of work in the jungle to hollow it out and to make it the mighty drum it has now become. According to Naga legends, it is said that favorable log drum trees are hosts to woodpeckers hornbill birds and hulok gibbons, the shouting of which is so often imitated by the Naga. When the tree was still in the forest, the monkeys used to praise its beauty, but now the human beings fulfill this task, and they pray to the drum. May the harvest be bountiful, may all beings be happy and rich, and may the leaders be strong. In the village, the women are waiting. The drum will have its new home inside the community house. 
But before the drum can take on its new role, a sacrifice has to be made. In the past, before headhunting was banned, it was essential to offer a human head to the log drum. In Naga belief, the simple power of the drum is equated with male power. This power joins with the female powers of the earth and thus produces bumper crops and the riches of the soil. The sacrificial blood is supposed to protect the drum from evil spirits. The wings are attached to the pole's side tips. The cock's head is pinned up to the tip of the forked post. In the past, a human head and tufts of its hair were used for this purpose. Naga are excellent hunters and feared warriors. But the best of the warriors wear a special piece of jewelry, a brass medallion showing a row of cut-off human heads. The successful warrior is entitled to make his merit visible to all. Each brass head stands for one decapitated victim. The custom of furnishing medallions is as ancient as headhunting itself. The craft is reserved to men who themselves have inherited this craft from their fathers. As is customary for tattooing, bamboo sticks are used as tools here. The mold is made from melted beeswax. Then the craftsman dips the wax mold into a mixture of water and ashes. The procedure is repeated and the wax mold is dipped into a heap of ashes of lime tree bark. Below the ashes is the fireplace. As soon as the cover has become solid enough through constant and cautious heating, one end is scaled and open. <laughs> Meanwhile, the wax mold has merged with the ash-lime bark mixture. The alloy liquefies and is poured into the mold. Immediately, it becomes solid. A Naga warrior wears his pendant as a sign of his well-deserved honor. The metal has taken on the shape of the wax mold. This process is known as the lost wax cast method. Each medallion is unique and signifies its wearer as a successful headhunter and thus depicts the merit gained by his community. The Naga believe that their heroes have a mysterious power at their disposal which all others are lacking. However, in order to maintain the balance among the members of the community, the heroes return their merit to their fellow villagers. This happens in a number of rituals and feasts that are held according to strict traditional laws. A new log drum is an occasion for such ritual feasting. After the warriors have brought it safely to their village, they are entertained with a sumptuous feast by the feast givers who have coordinated the drum pulling. The sound of the drum secures the solidarity of the people and is a guarantee of justice. 
all associated clans and Naga groups will fall under the protection of the new drum. On the occasion of a village feast, a pig has to be sacrificed. A warrior of the neighboring Ponyo Naga performs this task. He is a master of this form of ritual sacrifice in which the pig's heart has to be struck with one blow. The British colonial rulers were the first to try to prohibit headhunting in Myanmar. However, most of the elements of the traditional rituals can still be found today. It may well be true that human heads are no longer taken, but the ritual sacrifice of animals is still common practice. Through the dance around the sacred fire, the Ponyo evoke the log drum's protection. The spirit of the drum will protect all allied groups from any calamities. In order to make the invocation work, the drum has to be entirely smeared with blood. Only the finest warriors are eligible to perform this task. Traditional music is one of the pillars of Naga culture. Each Naga group claims hundreds of songs as their heritage. For the Naga, the sound of the Jews' harp contains all the sounds of their world. The voices of the woods, the rivers and lakes, the whispering of the wind when it touches the mountain slopes, those of the monsoon when it drenches the earth with new life. In the tunes of the past, the women praise the triumphs and heroic deeds of their husbands. In days long past, there was only one Naga tribe in which all people lived happily together. The Great Spirit favored the people because he was highly revered by them. So he always warned the Naga if misfortune threatened. He took advantage of one Naga's body in his vicinity and spoke through him to his people so that calamities could be avoided. Further southeast, down the Golden River Chindwin, is the habitat of the Yonkon Naga. They live off what the Golden River provides. Early in the morning, the fishermen gather. It is their duty to contribute to the well-being of the whole village. Close to the village, the river forks. At this spot, the water runs slow. As in every hunt, fishing too is connected to a special ceremony. Before the catch, the villagers dance and strike up their tunes. Together we will catch the fish, many fishes we want to have, and lots of rice. The secret of success is tree bark, the sap of which is poisonous. By threshing the bark, 
The sap mingles with the water and stuns the fish as they swim by. To collect them with their baskets is now an easy task for the women. The fishing method is based on the knowledge of their forefathers and has proven successful for ages. The catch is distributed equally among the villages. Fishing methods and the size of the catch show how the Nagas maintain the balance of nature. Although some Naga groups settled along the river, reasons such as security, climate and matters of belief made most Naga tribes settle in the hills. Even if this means that they have to cope with strenuous marches and a life in seclusion. Mountains as the seat of spirits have a deep an, imp an important nut lives inside the sun and from there dispenses his powers to the people. The closer the people are to him, the stronger is his blessing. As long as the community is in the arms of the caring nut's blessing, it may be sure of being in balance. Imbalance, however, may cause diseases then the shamans have to mediate between man and spirits. <coughs> a Paranaga complains about stomach ache and calls upon the village shaman in order to find out about the state of his health. The answer will be given by a chicken egg which the patient has brought with him. Without a special reason, the egg would not remain upright. However, since it remains upright, the shaman may put his patient's mind at ease. The state he is in is not alarming. Had the disease been serious, the water would have become muddy and black spots would have appeared on the eggshell. A healing liquid will make the patient recover. Important decisions are always a reason to consult a shaman. Building a house, for example, should only be undertaken when the omens are favorable. The house builder knots together strips of a banana leaf. From the way he forms the knots, the shaman may discern if the site and the time for building have been well chosen. <laughs> Shamanism and medicine are not merely male domains. At the outskirts of the village lives a woman healer. She also stands in close connection to the spirits and knows their will. Therefore she can ascertain the reasons for a disease from them. A warrior complains about severe pain in all parts of his body. By asking questions, the healer specifies her diagnosis. After cause and nature of the illness have been established, the therapy begins. The instruments are of natural origin, the horn of a mountain goat. Through sucking, the healer causes a vacuum between skin and horn. By this method, she tries to concentrate the germs from the entire body at this specific spot. A long needle is passed through the horn towards the skin. With a razor blade, she slices the inflamed skin.
こう A small scratch is enough to release the bad blood with all its germs from the body. The patient already feels relieved. Within a few days, his pain will have disappeared. Letting blood was also once a part of ancient Western healing traditions. In spring, Right after the New Year festival, planting begins of the rice terraces. The whole village takes part in sowing. Before the rice is planted, it's the men's duty to harrow the soil with hoes. A lot of strength and endurance is required since the soil has become hard during the long months of the dry season. The eldest of the village's priest clan ritually initiates the planting of rice. His position is hereditary and remains within his family. After he has praised the spirits, the planting can begin. Prayers to the nuts aim at securing the soil's fertility, achieving bumper crops and guarding the workers' health. Thus, sowing has been placed under the blessing of the spirits. Sowing and harvesting still dominate the Naga annual cycle to this day. As soon as the first fruit of the new rice has been eaten, all Naga women can begin their craft of weaving. Clear lines, strong colors and simple patterns reveal their natural sense of beauty and some of their world view. <laughs> Only in 1967 did the Myanmar government succeed in banning headhunting and left a deep cut in Naga culture. because he who was in possession of an enemy's head had not only conquered his life energy, but also the most precious element of this essence. Its fertility, responsible for the continued existence of the people. The Paranaga are hosting a solemn ritual. Under the command of the village elders, fertility poles are erected. They are divided into male and female poles, which are a bit narrower. In order to extend protection to the village community, the pole has been smeared with the blood of sacrificial animals. The number of animals sacrificed by the host may be discerned from the carvings on the pole. Five fertility poles have to be erected. At the upper part, the posts fork, like the horns of the highly revered buffaloes. From the forks, their power will spread to the feasting community. Oh. 
Now commences the second part of the great ritual. A more than 45 feet long bamboo pole is erected. It symbolizes the tree of life. All Naga men, young and old, have to lift it. The pole is surrounded by a plaiting of cane strips. Carved objects in the middle section of the pole remind one of swallows or buffalo horns. Small bamboo sticks are attached to them. They signify the teeth of slain enemies. When the wind blows through the bamboo sticks, their sound carries far into the valley. A sturdy Moithan bull has to be sacrificed. The master of ceremonies watches the ritual. Yalla, Joy. Yalla. Yalla. With a single spear thrust, the bull is killed. The size and strength of the animal makes the Maithan the most precious sacrificial animal of the Naga. It is slaughtered only on very special occasions. In great uproar, the bull is dragged away through the village to be gutted and butchered. The sacrificial blood is regarded as especially sacred. The entire village and invited friends take part in the ritual slaughter. According to a legend, a female Nart once handed over to the Naga medicine to heal all diseases. The village elder, however, left the medicine outside his house, with the result that cocks, pigs, buffaloes and other animals ate it. Ever since then, Animal blood is regarded as the strongest remedy. The intestines are dispensed among the clan members. Later on, the head will be given to the eldest of the clan as a sign of respect. For the time being, the head is hung on the middle fertility pole. From that position, he gazes at everyone present, and everybody knows his powers are ours now. The warriors have conquered the mighty animal. Its death will secure the continuation of their existence. Because the victory over an enemy or an animal increases the power of the living and fortifies their fertility. Life and death inseparably interwoven with each other. Mighty stones are to be dragged into the village. The Naga attribute great magical powers to stones. Most of the Naga groups believe they are descended from mighty stone monoliths. Some stones are regarded as being too potent for individuals. These are turned over to the clan elders who keep them at well-guarded places in the community houses. Lucky stones are beneficial for the community's bumper harvests, wealth, hunting prowess and rich offspring. Come on,
By erecting monoliths, the Naga commemorate their hero's status. These were either successful headhunters or have gained a surplus of wealth through good harvests which they share with the rest of the community in great feasts. In that way, they are reintegrated back into society. Jealousy and envy of other villagers are prevented and natural balance has been restored to the Naga community. Some aspects of Naga culture may appear strange or even gruesome, but they all serve the well-being and the continuity of the people. Perhaps that's the reason why Naga culture has survived for thousands of years and hopefully will continue to stand the test of time. <laughs>